All right, thank you everyone for coming here. So today I'm gonna to talk about stage proofs and blockchain interoperability. In my mind, probably one of like the most important features that Algorand has released or soon to release. All right, so blockchains are great, right? I mean, they brought us like peer-to-peer -peer trades, they're decentralized, secure, low cost, and they're always ready to available. This is really why we are all here and we love it. But they are walled gardens. There is a small problem with that. The first thing, like all the beauty that I've just mentioned is constrained within a protocol. You cannot do anything outside of it. It's pretty much impossible to interact with other chains. And I'll give examples, like say that you wanna trade just like Algo with ETH, not easy. You want, you have USDT, for example, both on Algorand and on Ethereum, and you want to move it from one chain to another. That's absurdly difficult without doing it. I mean, clearly you can do it centralized, but not, not what we want. And composability is another problem. Um, what should I say the lack of? Think of the example, if you want to build a dApp that utilizes more than one blockchain. Just um, if you know how to do it, please meet me after that because I'll be happy to know as well. And the other problem is that like, it really slows down the adoption of like, the traditional finance. The, the issue is that like, if we think about it, um, banks will probably adopt, you know, they will adopt the, the, the blockchain soon. They have not a lot of other options and they'll probably adopt one of them. Now they must be able to interact with each other. So think for example, if you have an account in Bank of America and the other person has an account and your friend has an account on Chase and you want to send it hundred bucks and you go to the bank and they tell you, no, sorry, we can't, we, we just cannot do that. And we don't like it. So what do people do? They really do it on a centralized, uh, through centralized parties, through central exchanges, et cetera. And like you see this guy, this one, like, well, we don't like him. Um, the issue with it, this is introduces risk higher latency and cost. And this is not the future we want. I mean, this is not why we joined the entire blockchain ecosystem. This is really the things we wanted to avoid and somehow we reintroduce them um, again. So what we really wanna do, we really want to unlock a generalized system of probability for blockchains and we want it to be um, trustless and efficient. We want it to be cheap. We want to be able to do that very, very easily the same way we interact within the blockchain. So essentially for, to go from this situation to that, just directly to the wall. Now, thank you. So essentially we want to, want to get to the point where it doesn't really where you are. You can be on a TriFi, you can be really on a, like on a blockchain, Web3 app. We want to be able to communicate through every single thing. We want to be able to do that and we want to do it in a decentralized fashion, um, really as we just used to within our blockchains. And this is really what we want to do. So once we have it, let's say that we have the solution and clearly I'm hinting here on a solution that we have. Um, so we really can build decentralized and trustless bridges and move money like easily. We can create multi chains dApps um, through essentially smart contracts and Oracle. Think for example, um, that you have one smart contract in one chain and you condition it on the state of another chain and they both like interact seamlessly. And we can, we can connect Algorand with any other entity. And most importantly, we really can just have much better user experience. Think really of a multi-token transaction. If I want to send now just Algo and Ethereum together, I can't, and wh why not? I mean, it seems something like it should be fairly trivial, um, but we're gonna get there. So how are we gonna do it? Gary here, Malov, welcome here. Um, we'll explain that. And that's going to be the great solution, please. <laughs> Hi, folks. So we met, we've named this topic state proofs at the top of the talk. Um, I'm, I'm again, I'm Gary. I, I hit up engineering here at Algorand. I'm here to introduce our initial investment in blockchain interoperability state proofs. So what's becoming clear, I hope, from seeing some of the previous slides, we need to provide a trusted solution that off-chain parties can use to verify that something occurred on Algorand. State proofs allow for this. So let's review some of the basics. There we go. Uh, a state proof is a compressed combination of signatures attesting to a state or event. Uh, the Algorand network generates state proofs that attest to the validity, the validity of a specific block on the chain on a regular cadence, i.e. every 100 or every 200 rounds. 
An external application or even a smart contract on another chain can use a state proof to pr confirm a transaction that occurred on Algorand. Uh, just to say up front, we put a lot of work into this early on. The cryptography has been excellent. Uh, it's been peer reviewed. It was published earlier this year. We have linked to the paper and several other references later in the slides. Uh, so let's keep going. What I want to do now is take you through how we actually generate a state proof. So first, a couple definitions. Uh, let n be the interval between our state proof rounds, as we mentioned. And we'll, we'll let x represent the rounds that we actually are generating the state proofs to attest to. Uh, so what happens here is in round x minus n, we generate what's called a participation commitment based on all the people that vote for what happens in that round. And we use this look back to know who are the online accounts when we're actually generating the state proof. Uh, then when we actually, once the actual state proof round or the round we'll be attesting to occurs, which in this document is round X, all of those participants know that they need to generate signatures in order, and which are gonna go into what we call a state proof. Uh, lost my track for a second. So once those signatures get generated, once those signatures get generated, we actually sit and wait. What we're doing is we actually have a wait time on to see when have we reached a high enough threshold such that, okay, we can, we can be very confident that these signatures represent the majority of the stake and it represents, it represents something we can trust in. So you notice there's a decreasing threshold here. We think that the actual truth is that a compact, cert is more, a compact certificate or a state proof is more compact the more signatures it is. I know it's counterintuitive. I'm not gonna go through the math behind it, but it's covered later on. It's covered on some of the links that we reach out to. Um, Higher level result I want to get out of this here is that a verifier needs to look at that previous block. It needs the state proof transact. Uh, it needs a state proof representing that round and the block header for that round. And there we go. So now, what can we use these for? Uh, state proofs enable us to create light clients to run either independently or on other blockchains of smart contracts. So in this diagram, we are showing how the light client's verified view of the state on the algorithm blockchain is kept up to date. Uh, a couple steps here. First, all state proof transactions are associated with a known address on the chain. So we can actually have any number, anything that's off chain, all it has to do is periodically query that address on the chain and be like, hey, do I have a new state proof transaction? Once it sees it, it's a pretty simple job. Its job is to propagate the state proof and the block header over to the other blockchain that we're connecting to. Um, once that gets submitted, our light client verifies the state proof and stores the block info. That's, that's running repeatedly on the intervals that we discussed earlier. So now at this point, we've seen how we can keep the, the state up to date. Let's see what happens once, how you use that light client. Cool, so uh, what I'm gonna do here is, in, and that didn't move, there we go. Um, what I'm gonna do here is introduce a trustless bridge. Um, refer to this as a trustless bridge because there's no validation happening in any of the blue section here, which, make, which is making up the bridge. Um, the verification happens entirely based off the Algorand light client, which is public. You can see it viewed on the smart chain. There's nothing, there's nothing in the centralized portions of this that are determining reliability or security. Um, so actually, another thing I wanna point out, anybody can run this trustless bridge. We expect there to be several, and we think that's a good thing because you'll build a great user experience through competition. We wanna provide the core components so that you can build these and repeatedly use them. Um, a bridge itself, I think most people, well, many people who are in the blockchain industry understand this, consists of a few parts. An app, you need an application or a smart contract that locks tokens on the original chain. You need a token minting app that actually creates the, new, the representation of that token on the target chain. And you need something for the user to be able to push a button and, get, and, push a button and actually kick off the transaction. Um, so rough flow here, user pushes a button, sends a transaction into the algorithm blockchain. We, we lock the tokens. We then, once we've confirmed that they're locked, we're sending them over to the token minting app. And, one, and what's interesting here is the token minting app itself is not actually doing any of the verification. It calls the light client and it's basically saying, hey, is this transaction real or not real? If the, trans, if the light client returns false, we try again in a little bit. If it's true, we can actually put the, to the we can deposit the tokens into the account target address on the new blockchain. So last thing I want to cover, and both I want to, last thing I want to cover here is some of the crypto primitives we had to leverage in order to do this. What was really interesting is we're actually focused on zero shark proofs that will be a pretty quick follow-up to this. So a lot of our choices 
we, have, we actually originally built state proofs with our, with our normal hashing operations. We, have, we use SHA-512-256 on Algorand for hashing, and we use ED-255-19 as our signature scheme. We actually found that these aren't very SNARK friendly, and if we actually rolled out with those, we would not have been ready to be able to take ZK SNARKs in the coming weeks and months ahead. So we actually introduced two things that are very SNARK friendly, subset sum hash. Uh, we, did, we did an Algorand specific implementation that's been publicly audited and we're leveraging the Falcon signature scheme as well, uh, with the latter actually helping us with post-quantum security, which we're gonna touch on in a moment. There we go. Last thing, some links on, on what we based this off of and where we can learn more. I just wanna acknowledge really the fantastic work of the cryptographers and the engineers in bringing this from conception to reality. Um, we're really excited to share this with the broader community and really enable much more liquidity on the algorithm chain. Um, and with that, I'm gonna hand back to Rotom to talk to you post-quantum security. Let me say a few words about um, post-quantum security. The, the known thing is that, which is the unfortunate part, is that the current signature scheme, the current crypto system is vulnerable. The moment we have quantum computers, we're done. Um, people will be able to basically regenerate the history. They will be able to, be, to compute your private key. They will be able to do a lot of bad things. And we don't want to do that. The complicated part is that it's really not that easy to defend against post-quantum uh, essentially the post-quantum era. The problem is that like, first, it's really the guts of the system. We need to change almost every single thing. And the technology is there, but not the easiest to use. And also it really requires you to regenerate your keys. It's just a massive change. And the other problem is that it's pretty much a problem of the future. Um, we don't know when it's gonna happen. And it's quite difficult to convince ourselves to work on post-quantum solutions when there is so many other things to do. Um, but the issue with this argument, and this is um, really the main problem, when you hear about it, it's already too late. If we got to a point where we know that there are quantum computers and strong ones, not talking about you know, the current supremacy that um, being called outside, um, it means that your network is already broken. It means that money probably already moved around, and it's kind of like too late. So why, why am I telling you all of it? Um, in Algorand, we've been working on a plan to, to be post-quantum secure um, in a non-invasive way for a while. And um, we got a solution. We got a solution that protects the history of Algorand. That's kind of like the first thing we need to do, which means that the moment there will be quantum computers out there, um, no one will be able to change the history of Algorand. That's set in stone. Um, and it's in stone forever. So yes, I think that you already heard about a solution. Um, it's called state proofs. And um, actually proud to say that Algorand provides you with the very first post-quantum security solution out there. The first blockchain that's actually ever gonna do that, which is huge in my mind. I mean, you know that your transactions are there forever to stay, um, no matter what happens there. And that's... Um, that's going to be our time with state proofs. You're going to stamp it over time and say we're supposed to secure so you can rest assured that nothing is going to change there. Um, let's talk about a bit the roadmap. So once now we're going to release um, state proofs early next year. So it's going to be ready available and everyone will be able to use it. Now let's talk a bit about what next. Um, so the very first thing we just said, it's post quantum secure. So your catch up process, essentially the way you catch up with the network and making sure that all the transactions you have out there, that's gonna be um, post-quantum secure, so you're gonna integrate the two. The second thing is ZK snark proofs. We talked about snark friendliness. Essentially, um, safe proofs are cheap, but you wanna make them cheaper. When it comes to working, essentially integrating them with smart contracts out there, last time I checked, Ethereum doesn't really go down with price, it always gets more and more expensive. Um, and we wanna make sure that we are aligned with that. So snarks proof will make it like very, very cheap. And the last thing we're gonna do is that to provide you with light clients, really kind of like make it available. No one will need to deal with this like mess of how to create light clients with safe proofs or with all these things gonna be out of box. Um, initially with Ethereum, just to make it easy for everyone. And also with tools that will be already available right after. So that's gonna be it for us. This was uh, state proofs. Hopefully you're gonna like it. That's really gonna change a lot of things in the way we work. Back to you.